Good evening and welcome. I am Tom Izu, Executive Director of the California History Center and the Audrey Edna Butcher Civil Liberties Education Initiative at Tianza College. I'm also a board member of the Santa Clara Valley Chapter of the American Civil Liberties Union. Um, before I get started, I'd like to recognize a few people. Um, Jeff Moore of the San Jose NAACP couldn't come, but he wanted to make sure we know that he has our, he has, um, we have his support. Also, I'd like to point out Genevieve Yip. She's the Santa Clara Valley ACLU Chapter Chair, and I think she's sitting back there by the literature table. And as more people show up, or if you're a famous person and I missed you, slip me a note and I'll make sure you're next. Many of us who have been active in the Japanese American community of San Jose, Santa Clara Valley area have been quite concerned with the increasingly hateful rhetoric being thrown about against Muslim Americans and others that is eerily reminiscent of the scapegoating and fear-mongering our community faced so many years ago. And it is especially upsetting for us to hear references during election campaigning made about the World War II imprisonment of Japanese Americans in a way that attempts to make it seem reasonable and justifiable to repeat a similar course of action that could lead to massive violations of civil liberties and the rights of individuals and entire communities. We have invested too much time in organizing and educating the public about lessons learned by our community during World War II to see our country suddenly have amnesia about its own history. Tonight, we first want to set the record straight and make sure all of us know the facts about the internment so our story is not used against others and against the reasons we fought for and eventually won redress. Then, we ask each of you to help stand up against scapegoating and fear-mongering and use this history and the stories you wish to share to inspire you to do so. We have a panel of representatives, organizations, and some special guests. We will have each give a very brief statement about this most urgent concern. We wish to have plenty of time for other comments, questions, and for some discussion at the end. So I ask respectfully for you to hold your own comments until that time. So we'll get started with our panel. First, we have Susan Hayasa of the Santa Clara Valley Chapter of the ACLU, who initiated this program to help organize it. She will read a joint statement. Stand up against scapegoating and fear-mongering. Recently, Japanese Americans across the country have been reeling with the fact that some political figures are citing the hostile and unconstitutional World War II treatment of Japanese Americans as a model for policy towards Muslim Americans, Muslim immigrants, and Syrian refugees. For example, many of you have heard that the mayor of Roanoke, Virginia, has cited the exclusion and incarceration of Japanese Americans to be the model for how to look at Syrian refugees. Donald Trump has proposed a mandatory registration of Muslims in the US and to exclude people from entry to this country based on their religion. Japanese American organizations have spent decades doc documenting the World War II experience of our community. Artists, musicians, educators and writers, as well as political activists, have made it a cornerstone of our community work to educate the public about the political causes and human consequences of the forced exclusion and incarceration of immigrants and their American-born children. We have been grateful and proud when others can use the lessons of the camps in the defense of their own civil liberties. As Japanese Americans, we stand firmly against any kind of scapegoating, and we object to the scapegoating of Muslim Americans, South Asians, Arab Americans, Sikhs, and others. We are committed to making sure that the lessons of the internment are heard, and that the desire of former internees that their experience never be repeated is not forgotten. One of the reasons that Japanese Americans have been deeply concerned are the recent statements by politicians and others citing the internment as a policy option for dealing with Syrian refugees and or Muslim Americans. Richard Konda, Executive Director of the Asian Law Alliance, Law Alliance, will tell us how these kinds of statements are invalid. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Tom. The incarceration by the United States government of the Japanese American community has been thoroughly repudiated 
This is important to understand when the uninformed and ignorant attempt to distort historical facts and cite the incarceration as good public policy. When Congress passed the Civil Liberties Act of 1987, members of Congress on behalf of the nation stated that the purpose of the act was to acknowledge and apologize for the fundamental injustice of the evacuation, relocation, and internment of Japanese Americans. When President Ronald Reagan signed the Civil Liberties Act on August 10, 1988, he stated, quote, we gather here today to right a grave wrong, unquote. He further stated, quote, for here we admit a wrong, unquote. During World War II, the U.S. Supreme Court failed to protect civil liberties in the cases of Fred Korematsu and Gordon Hirabayashi. However, the failure of the court was not caused by the quality of the arguments of the government attorneys, but because these same government attorneys suppressed key evidence and altered government documents. This one, misconduct by these government attorneys was unethical and criminal. In the 1980s, when this misconduct came to light, Fred Korematsu and Gordon Hirabayashi's convictions were vacated. In 2011, the U.S. Solicitor General, whose office argued the Korematsu and Hirabayashi cases at the Supreme Court, confessed to errors and mistakes made in both cases. Many individuals who were involved in the internment later deeply regretted their roles. Justice William O. Douglas, a member of the U.S. Supreme Court in the Korematsu case, stated that the evacu evacuation case was, quote, ever on my conscience, unquote. Chief Justice Earl Warren, who was at the time of the internment, the governor of California stated, quote, I have deeply regretted the removal order and my testimony advocating it. HL Online stands together with the other organizations here in standing up against hate, hate crimes, state scapegoating, and fear mongering. Thank you. Thank you. But camps did not happen in a vacuum. Understanding the history before Pearl Harbor should help us understand what's happening today and how scapegoating develops and grows, if not checked. Masao Suzuki, representing the Nihon Machi Outreach Committee, will give us the historical context. Thank you, Tom. Um, in 1983, the federal government uh, Commission on Wartime Relocation and Internment of Civilians, or the CWRIC, concluded that the World War II concentration camps for Japanese Americans was not justified by military necessity. Rather, the camps were based on, quote, race prejudice, war hysteria, and a failure of political leadership. Race prejudice against Japanese and other Asian Americans dated back almost 100 years before World War II. Chinese Americans were subject to special taxes, anti-miscegenation laws, and segregated schools and housing. Chinese Americans were limited to the hardest, dirtiest, and most dangerous work in mining, building railroads, as farm laborers, and as domestics. Japanese Americans who followed them were treated in much the same way. They faced the same laws here in California, banning interracial marriages, allowing local school districts to segregate Japanese Americans, and restrictive covenants that would ban um, Japanese, Chinese, and other non-whites from occupying and owning homes. Japanese Americans did much of the same work as Chinese Americans uh, during, uh, I'm sorry, before World War II. There are also new anti-Japanese laws, such as the Alien Land Law here in California, and many other states which ban Chinese, I'm sorry, Japanese and Chinese immigrants from buying farmland. <coughs> Chinese and Japanese Americans were also called drug dealers, prostitutes, rapists, much the same way that many slander Chicanos and Mexicanos today. Both Chinese and Japanese immigrants were banned from becoming U.S. citizens, and ultimately both uh, were, ended up being excluded from immigrating to the United States. In addition, I wanted to mention the issue of Warstein hysteria. Both Chinese and Japanese were seen as national security threats, um, known at the time as the so-called Yellow Peril, long before the outbreak of World War II. But with the outbreak of war, anti-Japanese sentiment exploded, leading to the massive injustice of the concentration camps. Over the last 15 years, the US wars in Afghanistan and Iraq have gone hand in hand with growing anti-Muslim attacks here at home. As victims of war hysteria in the past, 
We need to also stand up to war hysteria today in the form of anti-Muslim, anti-refugee, and anti-immigrant sentiments. We also need to look to the future, where the U.S. military pivot to Asia, growing tensions with China, and increasing persecution of Chinese-American professionals here in the United States means that the injustices of war hysteria could also be visited again on our Asian-American communities. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Al. <clears throat> what happened to Japanese-Americans after Pearl Harbor is not universally taught in the schools, and many of us, even Japanese-Americans, may not have learned all of the facts which can make it much more difficult for us to combat some of the misinformation out there. Jeff Yoshioka, president of the Japanese American Citizens League Silicon Valley chapter, will outline what specifically did happen to Japanese Americans back then. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Oh. Thank you. Um, let us remember the term Japanese nationals back then were the Issei's, the first generation, who at the time could not become U.S. citizens and own our land. Some had been in the United States for over 40 years and were raising their families. Japanese Americans were the children, and the children, the Nisei and Sansei, second and third generation, and were the U.S. citizens. On December 7, 1941, a day that would live in infamy, Japan attacked Pearl Harbor. This act brought the United States into World War II. Even before Pearl Harbor, the Issei and their families endured racism, hatred, abuse, and discrimination. Also, the FBI, working with the Office of Naval Intelligence and the U.S. Army, compiled a custodial detention and ABC list of those persons to be detained in the event of war. So, right after Pearl Harbor, the FBI detained all those on the list regardless of their status. The FBI engaged in conducting warrantless raids of Japanese American homes, arresting Issei's, ransacking Japanese American households. In a matter of weeks, the Issei, Nisei, community leaders, organization leaders, business leaders, Buddhist priests, teachers were among those suspected of being disloyal and were taken away. With the avalanche of accumulating fear, racism, greed, the Western Defense Command under General DeWitt asked the Secretary of War at the time, Henry Stinson, for authority to remove from certain areas all persons of possible, uh, all possible dangerous persons. <laughs> On February 19, 1942, President Roosevelt signed into law Executive, Nine, uh, Executive Order 9066. And soon after, Congress passed Public Law 503, which put teeth into EO 9066. The Executive Order 9066 did not specifically specify any specific group, just any persons deemed dangerous. Even though there were many more German and Italian ancestors, people of German and Italian ancestry on the West Coast, only the Japanese nationals and Japanese Americans became the scapegoats and deemed dangerous persons in this gross act of racism. Starting in March of 1942, persons of Japanese ancestry were ordered to relocate from the West Coast states. Fifteen assembly centers were opened to house over 90,000 of Japanese ancestry. The assembly centers were at fairgrounds, racetracks, and stables, converted into temporary living quarters. People stayed in the centers until they were moved to the hastily built concentration camps. So in closing, many of the reasons given back then for Executive Order 9066, removal of, from certain areas of all possible dangerous persons <laughs> were because of pe people's fears, racism, greed, and discrimination. All this, all of the, some of the same reasons that we're hearing today. Thank you. Thank you, John. For Japanese Americans, one part of understanding our past is getting past the euphemisms so we can recognize in the present efforts to obscure and make things seem reasonable when they're not. 
Tom Oshigari, co-president of the Japanese American Citizens League San Jose chapter, will outline the national JACL terminology recommendations. Thank you, Tom. Um, tonight you've heard the term concentration camp several times. I don't know if you've heard that before. You're probably more familiar with the term relocation center or internment camp or the term evacuation. These are all euphemisms that were presented by the U.S. military and the U.S. government during the time of World War II to make their actions seem much more benign than they actually were. And that language has carried over for decades until finally, it was three years ago, that the JACL created a handbook called The Power of Words, where they offered a recommended vocabulary to replace that original vocabulary of the military and of the U.S. government of the day. Um, and I'd like to go over like three of those terms in particular. The first is evacuation. Now, evacuation implies a removal of people temporarily to avoid a, an immediate safety hazard such as fire, flood, or bomb threat. Now, obviously, this was not the case for the Japanese Americans. So the preferred term, or the recommended term to use in their case is forced removal. Japanese Americans faced a forced removal from their homes, not an evacuation. The second term is internment. Uh, there's a legal definition of internment, and that is confinement of enemy aliens during time of war. Now that does appropriate, appropriately apply to the camps that were run by the Army and the Department of Justice who imprisoned the Issei community leaders who were rounded up shortly after the bombing of Pearl Harbor and were imprisoned as Japanese nationals, along with some of the Italian nationals and German nationals in places like Crystal City, Texas, which, were, which was a Department of Justice and prison camp. However, the 10 so-called internment camps run by the War Relocation Authority, which in itself is a euphemism, and that was a civilian agency. Um, those camps contain <coughs> over like, 110,000 persons of Japanese ancestry, and over two-thirds of those um, inhabitants were U.S. citizens. So the term internment, internee, does not apply to those camps. And so the recommended terminology to use there is incarceration. And this gives a more true picture of the prison-like uh, atmosphere of those camps. And finally, the term itself, relocation center. Uh, this again is a sort of a benign term that does not convey the prison-like um, structure that these camps were. They were compounds surrounded by barbed wire and guard, tire, guard towers manned by armed sentries. So these were just were not just relocation centers. These were prisons, and in fact. If we look at a population that is segregated, a minority population that is segregated from the general population and incarcerated, not for what they've done, but for who they are, this type of incarceration camp is considered a concentration camp. And that's why the recommended term here, instead of um, relocation center is American concentration camp. 
So in summary, what the Japanese Americans experienced was a forced removal from their homes and incarceration in American concentration camps on U.S. soil. Thank you, Tom. What is the human cost of scapegoating beyond rationalizing or promoting policies? This is not just an intellectual or political issue. There are human lives involved. And as we have spent time now talking about the facts and the history, there's another topic we'd like to address. One that we believe can help us all to recognize and understand when hate and fear mongering is happening. And these are the personal stories, the remembrances, and the feelings that help us em empathize and recognize our common humanity and I believe help inspire us to take a stand when we need to. Even if we don't know all of the history, don't feel we can win political debates or even feel scared sometimes. We can always struggle to have empathy for other people in regard to their safety and with regards to fairness and do the right thing when called upon. We have two panelists with us this evening who have agreed to talk about some of their experiences after the attack on Pearl Harbor. Jimmy and Eiko Yamaichi are both highly respected members of our community and both spent time in the camps during the war. Uh, first, I'd like to ask Jimmy um, a few questions. Can I ask a question? Okay, Jimmy. Um, Jimmy, before the war started, how old were you and, and where did you live? I was 19. And where did you live? Huh? Where did you live? I lived in Berryessa, uh, born and raised in Berryessa. Yeah, I think you were a neighbor of my mom, I understand. You were a neighbor of my mother, I yeah. believe, yeah. Um, eventually, you ended up in one of the camps, Tuvi Lake, and while there, I believe you heard stories from one of your other brothers. He had already been drafted into the U.S. Army before Pearl Harbor. Tell us about your brother's experience in the Army after Pearl Harbor, and how it influenced your response when it was your turn to be drafted. In my brother's experience, I think my brother, uh, actually our family, there were three uh, boys of eligible age to be drafted. My older brother, second brother, I myself, and the draft board said one of you have to go, and so we decided among ourselves, the, the second brother went to the Army. Uh, cut it short, <clears throat> he was uh, inducted the uh, summer of 1941, and he went to train at San Jose Principal uh, Camp Roberts, and the war broke out in uh, February, I mean, uh, December. And uh, his group, the Japanese American, at the time, there were quite a few of them in San Luis Obispo, and they were transferred to uh, Fort McBride, Kansas. And uh, the, all of these days, I think, got off the train, they all they took their arms away from them, the rifles, sidearms, and bayonets, and so forth. And what they did, they replaced with wooden guns. Now, how, say, uh, <clears throat> degrading it is to be walking around with a wooden gun when the guy next to you has a real gun. So the majority of all the whole Japanese American soldiers just gave up and just stayed in the barracks. And it's quite enough for them to the fight all whether they came out or not. <clears throat> At one time, there, President Roosevelt visited uh, Fort Riley, Kansas, for some reason, and they gathered up all the Japanese American soldiers, put them in the warehouse, and machine guns facing them. If they want to escape, they can escape, and they get shot right on the side there. So that's how, under that condition. Yet he signed up and went on to be for 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 two uh, veterans himself, and uh, he came home without much uh, scratch or anything. But that's the situation that he, he came under. And further on, we'll talk about other things. That, uh, the town will ask me about what uh, reaction I had to the situation. Yeah, why don't you, uh, when, when you heard your brother's story, what, what was your reaction when they tried to trap you? At the time there, my brother, was ready to be shipped over to France. I think it was, uh, was see, it was in 44, I think, you know, or 44. And uh, he, t he told the story about all this, what happened to the uh, Japanese American soldiers. 
And at the time I received my draft notice to report to the front gate. Now we're in the penitentiary. We had 28 guard towers around us, chain link fence all around. There was a double fence in front of that warning fence. And yet they want us to be redrafted, we volunteered to the US Army. And uh, I myself felt that I was a good American, I wasn't blue. But taking it over myself, what should I do? At the time, so I did not report to the front gate because they told you you're in a fishbowl, we can get you anytime we want, so, but we didn't go. So finally, in July of 44, we received a notice again that the mesh marshal will pick us up. And so we knew then we were probably be sent to the jail. But then again, we, we felt that, we did, I felt that I did the right thing. Not knowing to me, there was 27 of us that was taken to the Eureka Jail, it was a summer courthouse. And we put in front of the federal judge, and we all stood in front of him. And he asked, what kind of condition are you living under? I said, we are. Our towers all around us. We cannot leave without any permission. We do, we have an escort. So you're not a free man. After a week of dissertation, the judge finally came up with a rule. He studied the draft law. He says, you're not a free man. You're not given to process the law. I don't know why you should be subject to draft. So he exonerated us and we were free men. But, but the sad part of it, the other people, 300 or 400, some other other draftees that went, went they did fight the draft law on other camps. They spent three years in jail. Yet, as under the Federal uh, Social Security Act, it says only free Americans shall go into the Army. But they were not free as we were. The same conditions we were, but by lawyer, guard tower, and so forth. So that's the condition that I refused to go, but we were forward to be exonerated. Thank you, Jim. Uh, before I'd like to ask you a question. Aiko, <clears throat> um, tell us where you were when Pearl Harbor was attacked mm -hmm. and how old you were then. Uh, I was 16. And, and where were you? Huh? Where were you then? What, what state? You were in Washington when Pearl Harbor was attacked. Where were you? Oh, I, um, I was sitting in the par uh, living room, those days we called it parlor. <laughs> and uh, I was doing my homework and listening to the radio, typically like a teenager listening to the music, what have you. And then the interrupted said, uh, um, President Roosevelt came on the radio and said that um, uh, Japanese people, Japan um, bombed Fort Harbor. I couldn't believe it. And I sat there stunned, and then I thought, well, wait a minute. And I finally went outside, and there were, uh, all my neighbors were standing around there too, and all in disbelief. And they said, how could Japan come way over there to Pearl Harbor and bomb them, and then what? And so uh, I think most of us kind of stood around for about half an hour, so annoyed we couldn't do anything else. We all went back into our homes, but uh, myself, I just couldn't figure out, because I'm typically a teenager, so I just couldn't make sense of what was going on. And then the next day, um, uh, it was Monday, and we all had to go to school, and in doing so, see, I was a junior in high school, so I went, went the following morning, we, we had to walk to our school, I think it was about an hour and a half or so. And right away, I could feel this feeling of prejudice, discrimination, and the friends that I thought were friends, or my girlfriends who were my friends, were very distant. Um, they didn't approach me to say good morning or anything like that. And I thought, yeah, this is a girl, a teacher. Um, conducted the class like she ordinarily would, but um, I could already feel this tension. 
And finally, I, I realized that because December 7th, Pearl Harbor was bombed, that they felt that I had something to do with it because I have the same color of face that people in Japan. And so it finally hit me. And it, it, I can't describe this feeling that I had that people and friends, teachers who thought were very kind and respectful to me were so distant. And when the evacuation did really happen, the principal did not say anything, didn't even phone, teachers didn't approach us, we were all alone. And that's when I finally realized that prejudice was happening, discrimination, scapegoating, whatever you want to call it. And at that time, being a teenager, it, it's even as, as I'm sitting here and I'm talking about it, it, it's a feeling that it's hard to express. So that's what happened. Thank you, Rico. This going today is aimed at Arab Americans of all backgrounds, Muslim Americans, and many other immigrants, such as Sikh Americans and South Asians. And now we have a very special guest who will tell us his own stories pertaining to scapegoating and profiling. We are honored to have with us Adar Siddiqui, Vice President of the South Bay Islamic Association, who will share some of his own stories about what's happening now. I haven't even spoken and I got it <laughs> Good evening, friends I haven't yet met. I'm honored to be here uh, with you to exchange ideas, learn about one another, dispel, uh, dispel myths, and build bridges. The world has become a less civil place. Uh, atrocities are being committed by uh, misguided fanatics, and those seeking to divide us are spreading hateful rhetoric to help them achieve their means. As an American, and as a Muslim, I'm personally very saddened to see select media outlets, uh, some so-called leaders of our great nation, and many who hold extremist views act in such an irresponsible manner. Rather than aim to come together during this crucial time, uh, it appears that some have an agenda to try to tear us apart. We are the United States of America, and I, for one, do not want us to become the divided States of America. My family has been in the U.S. since 1957, since my parents moved here. I went to West Valley Elementary School, Cupertino Middle School, and Homestead High School. My 19-year-old son and 15-year-old daughter went to those same schools. My son is starting at UCL, UC Berkeley this coming Monday. My daughter is a sophomore, uh, at, at, uh, secretary of her sophomore class. I was my son's baseball coach and my daughter's basketball coach. My wife volunteered in each of their classes for many years. I work at SanDisk Corporation, sit on the boards of multiple nonprofit organizations, and have volunteered at a soup kitchen since the early 90s. Bottom line, our family is like any other family in America. We work hard, enjoy the company of family and friends, and do what we can to make the world a better place. What's important to us is what's important to you all, and on our mind are the same things. The sad state of our schools, increased traffic on the freeways, and how to get the 49ers back to their winning ways. <laughs> but it's tough to focus on those areas when my daughter comes home after telling me that someone asked her why are all Muslims evil? Or my son says he was asked if he was a terrorist. Or my wife is once again randomly picked for additional searching at an airport. Just a few weeks back, upon leaving a place of worship, a driver rolled down his window and with a look of disgust I will not soon forget, screamed, go back to where you came from. He drove away before I could respond, Redwood City? <laughs> so the current climate is bad and it has adversely affected the 99.9999% of Muslims who are peace-loving, law-abiding, and noble citizens. What gives us hope, however, is the fact that many other minorities have faced discrimination, oppression, and stereotyping, including many of us here this evening, and they have overcome. Through your work ethic, character, and exemplary behavior, you have become role models for your communities and shown the haters and critics 
that their blanket assessment of you was completely wrong. Even more inspiring, through events like this one tonight, you have demonstrated that you will not allow such labeling to occur to other groups. And because of that, I am hopeful, I am optimistic, and I am most appreciative. Thank you very much. Um, as Masao mentioned, a federal commission in the 1980s determined that race, prejudice, war, hysteria, and a failure of political leadership led to the imprisonment of Japanese Americans during World War II. What we less next like to focus on is that last statement, a failure of political leadership. And why it is so crucial to remember this failure some 70 years ago, and why it is so important now not to allow it to happen again. Mike Kaku, representing the Japanese American Citizens League Sequoia chapter, will discuss how this happened in the past and now how it's happening today. Thank you. Um, during, during World War II, as far as with the Japanese Americans, um, all types of media was used to spread propaganda that were that basically was saying there was no difference between Japanese Americans and the Japanese um, Imperial Army, military, the enemy. The Japanese Americans looked like the enemy, they had names similar to, to the enemy, so they must be the enemy. Propaganda, anti-Japanese American propaganda, rumors, lies were spread to say that the Japanese American family who has lived next to you for the many years cannot be trusted. They were spies, traitors. Japanese American farmers and fishermen were accused of eating the enemy by the, the layout of their, of their um, um, orchards and using the fishing boats uh, to aid the, the enemy of vehicles and, and boats. None were true, but power of anti-Japanese American propaganda was powerful then. But that is what's happening now. Now the propaganda is that all Muslims are bad, all are terrorists, they must be investigated, checked out, registered, not allowed to enter the U.S., gathered up and put in prison camps. All too familiar. We look to politicians for leadership for defending our constitutional rights, justice for all under the law, to stop hysteria, fear, greed, racism, but in fact, many of the politicians are the ones who are perpetuating the propaganda. As mentioned previously, statements from presidential candidates, governors, mayors, and others have been pushing for banning, restricting, registering, even detaining all Muslims. So the atmosphere in the propaganda is very similar to what has happened to the Japanese, what happened to the Japanese Americans during World War II. One point of example of how the, how the politicians are, are failing in this particular case, um, fairly recently the Republican-led House Resolution 4038 um, that was passed fairly quickly. This, if this bill basically be, is an, enacted, it would extend the already long process for Syrian and, and Iraqi refugees to enter the U.S. This process would make it so long that in essence, they would prevent them from coming to the U.S. You know that this bill was introduced not only to address the issues of refugees, but it is, a, it is making a statement, cocoon in the atmosphere of anti-Muslim thinking and using all Muslims as scapegoats in our attempt to reduce our fear of terrorism. I know that if we disagree with the actions of politicians, we need to let them know loud and clear. That's one thing as an individual we can do to fight against scapegoating, hysteria, racism, and fear. Thank you. Thank you. Now for our last speaker on our panel, we have a very special guest who will talk about efforts underway to help address this issue directly as it pertains to the profiling and scapegoating of Muslim Americans in particular. One of the organizations that is very prominent in this effort to protect the rights of people against scapegoating is CARE, the Council on American-Islamic Relations. 
Bryce Hammock, Northern California Civil Rights Coordinator with the Council for American Islamic Relations and an attorney, will talk about CARE's work and, and his perspective on the current political climate. Bryce? Thank you, Tom, and thank you all the panelists for uh, sharing your stories and your insights on what's going on. And thank you all for coming out here tonight. Uh, CARE is, for many that don't know, is the nation's largest and oldest American Muslim civil rights advocacy organization. It's been around for over 20 years now, and it was actually founded right here in the Bay Area um, before it moved off to D.C. and shot off into about 20 to 30 offices across the country these days. Thankfully, we have our office right here in the Bay Area. Um, we service hundreds of thousands of American Muslims who live here in the Bay Area, and we provide a range of services and programs for the community. Uh, myself, I work in the Civil Rights Department, so anytime someone has their civil rights infringed on or violated, we provide free legal services to them. So this can include law enforcement abuses, travel harassment, employment discrimination, school bullying, pretty much anything you can think of where someone being an American Muslim and identifying as Muslim or even appearing Muslim uh, as we said earlier, unfortunately our Sikh brothers and sisters are getting a lot of the brunt of this animosity toward uh, American Muslims in, in this climate today. Uh, but we provide free legal services from you know, consulting, advising, all the way up to litigation. But I think one of the more important things that we do in our office is community outreach, it's youth programming, it's government interaction. Uh, as we just mentioned, mentioned uh, failure of political leadership is usually a really big issue when we're talking about these things. Uh, just tonight, our government relations coordinator, Samina Usman, was actually invited by Congresswoman Zoe Lofgren to attend in person the State of the Union address. So CARE is out there as much as possible trying to interact with political leadership to let them know that these, this is what's going on in our community, this is how you can help. Uh, just today, uh, Uther and I were at Mayor Licardo's office talking about how the city of San Jose can work with schools with relocated immigrants in the community. After that meeting, I drove up to meet with DA George Gascon up in San Francisco to talk about how the DA's office can help protect people in the community who are being subjected to these, this type of fear-mongering. And a really good quote I took away from that was that he was unequivocal in his stance that they will have zero tolerance for anyone who engages in any type of hate, physical, verbal, anything toward people in his community. So. By reaching out and talking to political leadership, you're humanizing the American Muslim experience. You're showing them that they are your teachers, your children's coaches, your neighbors, your coworkers, the kids that your children are playing with. They're just like anyone else. So through humanizing that, we can really make a big impact. Finally, I think empowering our youth is something that I'm really proud uh, to be a part of here at CARE. Uh, this, year, this year in the Bay Area, we launched the Muslim Game Changers Network. This was a three to four month intensive program for high school youth all over the Bay Area where we taught them how to interact with media, how to interact with government officials, how to do grassroots organizing, how to frame issues, how to do anything that any civil rights organization does all across the country, but we wanna make sure that our youth have these skills so that they can start early on. And a really cool story I'll finish off with, um, we have, there's a brother, his name's Nasser. He goes to his school out in the peninsula and there's a really famous uh, advocate, her name's Linda Sarsour, she's from Brooklyn. She's, she's been getting a lot of attention lately for a lot of her advocacy efforts. She came out and spoke at that school with Nasser and was co-sponsored by the Muslim Student Association and the Feminist Student Club, which we were all really impressed by, you know, building those bridges and showing people that, you know, we're not just about us, we're about the entire community as a whole. And just this week, he shared a, a lot of photos that his school, all the clubs on school are now coming up with these anti-fear, uh, they're pro-Muslim, pro-love, pro-connection, pro-commonality campaigns. They're putting posters all over. Clubs that you didn't even know existed are making commercials and doing photos and things like that. So by working to empower our youth, I think that's ultimately what's going to prevent any you know, future internment camps, incarceration camps, concentration camps. So thank you very much for having me tonight. Thank you, Brian. Before we start our question comment period, if you could please uh, give a round of applause to all the people on the panel. Who... I, think, I think they did pretty well. There's a lot of organizations here, and usually it doesn't work as well as this. I think it just shows how concerned they are about this issue. Um, so we're going to have some time for you to ask questions, to make comments. Um, of course, I ask you to be respectful and patient. There's a microphone up here, um, and our helper here, don't trip him, please. 
it's my son, uh, is going to run around with the microphone so uh, we can hear your question. Um, so, who has it first? So, right, right here, right. Right to me. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Thank you. I have two comments that I feel are very, very hopeful. One is we just had some British friends visit, and they told us that the British Parliament has banned Trump from entering England because <laughs> of his anti-Muslim remarks. Yes. And the other is that the mayor of Bainbridge Island in Washington, where there were a lot of Japanese Americans taken and incarcerated. They have done a good job of welcoming them back and there are lots of monuments and exhibits and so forth. He said that what Bainbridge Island has learned from that experience means that they will welcome refugees and there will be no anti-Muslim feeling there. So I think the more we can spread the hope the closer we are getting to a better world. Um, I wanted to make, kind of connect the dots a little bit. Um, under the Obama administration, there had been more deportations during that period than any other time period um, in U.S. history and um, mainly focusing against uh, people from Mexico, South and Central America. Um, many of them are running away from, they are themselves refugees running away from horrible violence, especially in an area like El Salvador and Honduras. And in this time period also, lots of privately built um, detention centers have been opened which are keeping men, women and children locked up basically incorporated in private prisons. Um, the con their conditions being horrendous, many of them have gone on hunger strike. My concern is that the U.S. government is using them as um, guinea pigs to find out our tolerance for this kind of treatment. And um, this, could, this could really lead to mass incarceration of people, um, not just of Arabs and Muslims, but anybody who's standing up against the government. So it's just a comment I'd like to make of connecting those dots. Thank you very much. Um, uh, that's a really good comment. Uh, there's a, a Japanese American um, psychotherapist who was uh, asked by, I believe, the ACLU to go visit some of those detention centers. And she herself was, um, I believe she was born in a camp. And she, uh, her report was that the atmosphere in those uh, camps, those family camps for refugees from Central America was, she said, I know a concentration camp when I see one. And um, she testified as to the, uh, the conditions in the camp and how they fostered a breakdown of family cohesion and um, created depression and um, you know trauma, in, especially in children. And so I think um, uh, some of us have been trying to get that message across to the Obama administration. And I think you know if people are concerned about things like that, I would advise you to start learning about those camps and. Uh, Speaking out about those camps is something concrete that, uh, that people can do. I'm just going to share something that Pastor Dima Moore said. For speaking for the Jews, I wasn't a Jew, so I didn't speak up. Then they came for the communist, I wasn't a communist, so I didn't speak up. Then they came for the trade unionist, and I was not a trade unionist, so I didn't speak up. Then they came for me, an American Muslim. And I just want to say thank you so very much to all of you for coming here. All the love that I feel, there are so many in this room that I am proud to call my friends. And I just want to say thank you. We are one humanity 
there is only one creator, we have one world, and God wants us to know each other. That's why I founded American Muslim Voice Foundation, and our motto is from fear to friendship. Thank you again. Thank you. Who had um, mentioned a, a House bill passed that affects the ability of Syrian refugees to enter the country and others? And um, we have a, a, somebody who can say a little bit more about that. And I was wondering if Richard, Richard Cornyn could introduce him. Yes, uh, so we're very, we're very fortunate this evening that um, Igor from the International Rescue Committee is here. The International Rescue Committee is a, a worldwide organization that helps um, resettle refugees. So their organization is very uh, informed about the process. I think there's been a lot of disinformation. So I think Igor wants to share some of that information this evening. Thank you. Uh, 
the Syrian refugees since 2001 started uh, Syrian civil war, there was 23,000 people referred by UNHCR. 7,000 of them were interviewed by the DHS, and only 2,000 of them were admitted to the US. Out of those 2,000 refugees from Syria that they admitted in the US, zero people were arrested and uh, or removed from terrorist activities. Thank you. Thank you very much. So it sounds like it's easier to run as a, for the presidency in the Republican Party than to be a refugee in this country. Um, are there any other questions or comments? Uh, I think there's one. Um, I think it's important to recognize the role of scapegoating um, in diverting attention from the real threats to uh, our well-being in this country. Um, I work with the Low Income Self-Help Center, and I have a lot of experience working with people from all you know, colors and ethnicities who are really suffering from lack of housing and, and decent health care. I think their experiences can be generalized throughout the whole country. For instance, I know that 45,000 people a year die from not having health insurance. And something like 4% of all deaths are due to poverty. And if people are thinking and blaming Muslims or other scapegoats for uh, their problems, they're not addressing what they need to be addressing to um, force the government to take care of those issues. And I think that that's an important reason that, that this takes place. Thank you. I think there's another gentleman right now who can just pass the mic. Thank you. Yeah, um, yeah I, I want to speak a little bit to the psychology of the situation. Uh, that in each of these scapegoating situations, we have a hope oh, it's not just somebody's been bad to you, it's because. A whole institution is structured to, to damage you. Uh, and so, um, and, and, and we are reluctant to really talk about the psychology as well as we might. I know Peg does very good work in that area. But, um, it, so there's a, there's a, uh, a, a person who runs the, is the editor of the Journal of Trauma and Dissociation. Uh, who uh, is uh, a specialist in what we call institutional betrayal trauma. We're talking here institutional betrayal. Uh, and she, Jennifer Fry, is going to be speaking at the Anza College next, in, next month, February 24th. And people are certainly invited to come and help us build this uh, argument. Thank you. I, I think there's somebody in the, the back here. Yeah. Yes, um, I'd like to speak to a, another form of discrimination that, that occurred right here where we live, and that's uh, class discrimination. Uh, we have over 4,000 homeless, unsheltered people living in the streets here in San Jose. They're constantly being swept by the, uh, the city, by Caltrans, by the county by uh, Union Pacific Railroad, any place where they live. They don't own any property, so wherever they go, they're trespassing. And they're uh, criminalized for their behavior. Some of the behavior is natural. It's, uh, we all have to use the restroom at one time or another. But uh, because they don't have a place to use it, they get criminalized when they respond to what is natural. Um, so I would like to just point out the fact that uh, we need to be a little more tolerant of the people that are, um, who most, most of them, uh, no choice of their own, find themselves homeless and uh, have no place to go. Thank you. Thank you. There's a there's another person. Hi, um, my name is Debbie Nanaga. 
I live in Mount Lee Buddhist Temple. Um, I'm the superintendent of our Dharma schools, which is our Sunday school for children pre-K through high school. And I like what you say about educating our youth, and I take that very seriously. Um, as a Buddhist, a lot of times people ask me if I rub the big guy's belly, and, and it's a lot of ignorance that's out there. And I think that's part of the problem right now with the Muslim communities, community. And um, I guess I'd like to ask um, where I can find information to educate our youth. And I'd like to be able to show them how much we're similar. And, and if I have information or literature that teaches even our smallest children. Um, you know, we, we try to practice right view, right conduct, compassion. But I think if, if I can get some material, that would be very um, powerful. Um, so if you could help me with that, I'd appreciate it. And also, I will say it's a personal uh, interest of mine because my brother-in-law is Iraqi American. He's Muslim, and uh, he's one of the best people I know. Yeah, so there are organizations out there that specifically work with building curriculum and building uh, workshops and lectures, whether it's for students in a school or whether it's for teachers and faculty or people in a workplace. They even uh, perform workshops for law enforcement. They're called ING, the Islamic Networks Group. And I'll give you my card and I'm happy to put you in touch with them. But it is becoming more common here in the Bay Area that when there's an incident of bullying or teacher discrimination, or maybe there isn't, that teachers are starting to implement curriculum to build on those commonalities. Um, I just went to some really cool uh, presentation at Renaissance Academy out in Elm Rock, and the teacher there had given their, his students, I think they're about 10, 11 years old, a project either to cover the five pillars of Islam or to cover what Islam has contributed to art, music, culture throughout the years. And what I thought was the most amazing part was the last part of the project was, how is this similar to what my religion teaches? And it was really cool to see these kids talk about, oh, I didn't know, you know, they went on a pilgrimage because we go to a pilgrimage in Mexico City, or I didn't know they fast because we fast as well. And so it was giving them those commonalities. So I agree, I think teaching the youth and especially focusing on commonalities is a really big way to go, but it's starting to become more and more common. Thank you. Um, there's a question over here. I, I know Jimmy wants to say something, but can you see the gentleman's hand? Oh. I just want to reiterate what Brian just said. ING, when you go to ING.com, they have a lot of the syllabus out there online for teaching children. They're really going to specialize in teaching the children because they're trying to prevent just exactly what you're doing. But I would uh, highly recommend getting hold of Maha Janai, who's the director of ING, go to ING.com, and Ricardo Kitchen, because there's a new outreach. It seems like a lot of people are learning about Muslims. And ING is just also starting another program, in addition to the education, of reaching out to communities. In other words, we're trying to figure out how to how do we get the word to people who just want to learn something that part of the formal presentation or anything else? Meet some Muslims. Just a quick question. It's ING.org. I think ING.org will take you to ING. I'm sorry. ING.org. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. There's another gentleman right here. First of all, I'm very sorry to be late today. I uh, start my best on time. I'm a teacher and I must be in class on time, I understand. I am very grateful to the community of Jamaican uh, American for what they have done to us. Since 9 11, uh, they have been very supportive. And on behalf of the Arab community, I belong to the Arab Cultural Center San Jose. I would like to thank you very much for what you have done on our behalf. And I uh, appreciate that. Any other questions or comments? We're in the back there. Sorry, tell me don't have a question.
Um, good evening. Thank you, everyone, for um, sharing some of your organizational experiences and your testimonies. I think, as you know, someone living here in the South Bay, it's good to see the connections with you know the chairman of Japanese Americans and what's happening with um, within our the, the Muslim Arab community. I'm just had a question for whether it's care or anyone that can answer it. What are the statistics or you know the percentages of Islamophobia that occurs in Santa Clara County? Um, I think as someone that you know um, works with young people, I would like to know a little bit about that. Is that something prevalent in our community? Um, so that for those of us that live in the area, we can take action to address it. Thank you. Middle school, high school, and the what we heard back was about 50 to 60 percent of the youth we surveyed said they had been bullied in some way, shape, or form. Whether that's verbal attacks, whether that's physical assaults, teacher discrimination, accommodation issues, we think that number's probably higher. Um, you know, when I was a kid, I wasn't going to tell anyone what my problems were, whether or not it was some stranger or my parents. So we think it's a lot higher. Um, but it is something that we're working to address quite often. We just released a report based on that survey. I wish I had brought copies with me. Um, but I can, if you want to, uh, I'll give you my card and we can, I can get your information. I'm happy to send those reports out. It details all our statistical finding. It tells you how many reports came out of the counties, uh, what types of abuse we're hearing about. It even has some of the personal stories that some of the students told us. So I'm happy to share that with you all. And you can find it online as well at ca.care.com. Uh, I mean, yeah, so there, there was a story a few years ago uh, here in South San Jose of a student who was hijabi, so she wears the Islamic head start with the hijab, and she was talking with her classmates before class started like any normal high school student does, and probably was talking after the bell had started. Um, the teacher came up to her and, you know, slammed her hand on the desk and was like, if you don't shut up, I'm going to rip that thing off your head. Uh, it, it was a really traumatizing moment for the girl, and we worked really hard with the school to kind of implement sensitivity training and diversity training. And I think one of the coolest things that came out of that was that the girl actually started a club on her school, the Muslim Students Association, uh, the MSA, which is normally found at the college level, but it's starting to become more popular at the high school level. She founded that based on that experience and used it as a vehicle to educate and to empower her student body. So I thought that was a pretty awesome message. And the teacher never, ever apologized. The principal did, but the teacher still has apologized. We can't comment on uh, cases, but... <laughs> thank, thank you. Um, I'd like to make a comment about some of them are homeless. Now, uh, I don't think you know what homeless means. The Japanese American returning from camp was let out by a thousand were let out. There was no home, no place to go, no jobs. San Jose Buddhist Church itself. I'm not bragging. We processed over 1,700 people through there. At one time, there were 400 people in the gymnasium and uh, about several hundred inside the uh, temple. We took the spills out and we lay out so they could sleep on the floor. No mattress, no nothing. There was no government agency whatsoever, whatsoever. Came out and says, we are, we'll give you a stipend for food or whatever it is. There's three shower stalls and 400 people. Three little cooking tops and 500 people that cook on three little cook tops. So we survived. We came up where we are today. Thank you. I just wanted to uh, talk a little bit about ideas uh, that people could take home and uh, exert some political leadership themselves. So the idea of political leadership, we usually think about politicians. Um, but po political leadership is something that, that anybody can do. Um, how many people here belong to a club or a church or an organization? Just raise your hand. Almost, almost everybody does. Um, one idea is uh, to exert political leadership is to go to your organization and say that you want to talk about the issue of scapegoating. And most people are against scapegoating once you explain it to them. Um, and you can get your organization to make a statement, kind of a, a statement of unity with other people. And um, you, 
you can you could go to your city council and you can get your city council to make a statement. You know, and the more people that do this, what it means is that the people who have hateful ideas are uh, less powerful because more and more people are willing to take a stand and willing to stick their neck out. So that's that's an idea. So I, I hope that people uh, think about what they can do in their organization. Maybe your organization can go to your city council and get them to make a statement, or um, or um, you know send an op-ed to the paper, or in some way uh, make you know exercise political leadership in that way and make sure that other people find out what you think. I think a lot of that is being done. What we need to brainstorm about is how we can bring those people that are not here. That's the biggest part of it. All of us probably have done the same thing. Mark. I just said that people that are here, they are like-minded people anyways. How can we reach out to the people that are not here? And those are the ones that are, have so much hate in their mind, soul, and heart. I think only love could change them. But I even offered to have Donald Trump come to my house. I'll cook him a meal. <laughs> That's the only way I could get even with him. <laughs> Did you want to make a comment? Um, a number of years ago, maybe more than a decade, Delorme McCall Stoffel, who is now the director of the Human Relations Commission, held a workshop called Interrupting Prejudice, which changed my life. Her approach was when somebody says something hateful, or scapegoating. You just don't stop them, which is what I've done, which I did all my life thinking that I was doing a good thing. You have to try to engage them in a dialogue. You've got, you've got to ask a question. Um, what makes you feel this way? Or what experience did you have that makes you say that, or some way to get a dialogue going. If you just stop them, there's no hope of any change. But if you can get a dialogue going, then maybe you can offer an invitation to a gathering like this. Or to Samina's home. <laughs> Yes, I Thank you very much. Um, I think Marcel wanted to make a comment. Hello. Okay. Um, actually, I wanted to make a pitch. Um, the Niamanchi Outreach Committee is doing our 36th annual Day of Remembrance. The theme of this year's Day of Remembrance is War Hysteria, so it fits right into this program. And it's going to be on our traditional date, which is uh, the Sunday of President's Day weekend, February 14th. It's also Valentine's Day, so we'd like you to share your love with us and come to our program. Very importantly, for the last 25 years or so, we've actually been at the Buddhist Temple Hall, but because it's undergoing earthquake renovations, we're actually going to be at the Moore Staley Auditorium in San Jose State University. And following the program there, we're going to process to the Yoshichida Gym. Um, and the men's gym at San Jose State was actually the um, historical site where Japanese Americans were initially assembled and then sent to the temporary assembly centers. Um, one of our speakers that evening is going to be um, Jimmy Amici, who's here on our panel. So I have flyers. There's flyers on the table, and I'll probably try and get you up on the way out, but I'd like to invite you all. And so since the mic is here, I'll also pitch um, Saturday, January 30th, from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m., um, there's going to be a Fred Korematsu uh, program at the Japanese American Museum across the street. There's a variety of different kinds of activities that they there are flyers on the table. And that was a great transition because I wanted to go into that next because um, we have refreshments and there's literature here. And uh, we'd like you to uh, think about what has been said and if you have other questions, comments, you want to keep 
Okay, I want going, please feel free to do that tonight. Um, this has been as a starting point to get our community together and others to support us to talk about how to deal with scapegoating. Um, I would also like to make a pitch. The Anza College has a day of remembrance program, February 18th, 1.30 p.m., and the focus of this program is on Islamophobia and how to counter it. Um, so is there a, let's see, if that's okay, maybe we should move, because I wanted to thank the Methodist Church for letting us use their hall here. Um, and the Sequoia chapters of the JCL provided some refreshments and they're all very patiently waiting back there. And so please help yourself and look at the literature table, come and talk to us. Um, I, I think we're gonna wrap up the formal part of the program. Thank you very much for, for coming.